imagine that curve in the center going to infinity in both directions in terms of the wavelength of vibration. So what we know is that, as I said, universal truth, the law of polarity, is that everything consists of the complementary opposites, so the positive and the negative. And we see this in nature and we see this in all the sciences and ologies. For every night there's a day, for every winter there's a summer, for every wax there's a wane, for every ebb there's a flow. In cosmology, for example, galaxies collide, stars die, new ones are birthed with a new material. On the Earth's surface, in geology, for every destruction of the Earth's surface, there's a construction. In biology, when you go to gym and you're pumping iron, any kind of exercise, what you're actually doing in order to build your muscle is you are breaking those muscle fibers, which is why it's sore after the exercise. So there is no build without destroy. There is no construction without destruction. Those are two halves of the same whole, um, and they live entangled side by side. So we know that the universal law of polarity is that everything exists as a set of complementary opposites. So everything can be separated into two wholly opposite parts and that each of those still contains the potentiality of the other. So what this means, this is the good news and the bad news that I'm here to, sh to share with you today, is that the law of polarity applies in our lives too. And what it means is that we will experience positive and negative, support and challenge, pleasure and pain. You already know that every single relationship you have is pleasure and pain. We experience happy and sad, success and failure, easy and difficult, acceptance and rejection. And uh, we know all that positive thinking movement of the 80s and 90s, and then we beat ourselves up the next day because we couldn't help having negative thoughts when we're driving in Johannesburg traffic or something. So we're not going to be more positive than the negative. But that's not the bad news. I'm going to explain anyway, that. You can actually uh, solve this problem. I just listen to I, I All right. Just a reminder for everybody to keep their, keep their microphones muted. All right. So the universal law is that there's the balance of both. That we're going to have positive and negative. But the problem is that we were all raised on watching Hollywood movies and reading fairy tales. And I know when my daughter was two years old, I didn't even have to read what it said on the last page. She knew. And they lived happily ever after. And I really get the impression working with people that everybody's kind of waiting for their happily ever after to arrive. Um, and uh, this is the source of, of a lot of our problems and our misery because the happily ever after is the fantasy, right? So it creates this unrealistic expectation that we should have a life and existence that is just positive and peachy and wonderful all the time. And so every time this stuff shows up, the negative, yucky, difficult, painful side of our lives, we go, ding, something's wrong here. We're not, not supposed to be this way. I'm not supposed to be experiencing all the stuff. And so we do our level best to make it go away. And we're trying to get rid of the negative, painful sides of our lives. So what do we do to get rid of it? We drink a bottle of whiskey. We eat a bar of chocolate. We become exerciseaholics, workaholics. My favorite one now is everybody seems to be uh, anesthetizing themselves on binge watching Netflix. And I say that with zero judgment. Um, and then, of course, a pop an antidepressant, anything to create for ourselves the illusion that, uh, that we don't have a negative side or just to get rid of the negative side of our lives. And we know that we can't. Anything that you do to try and make your life less negative or appear that way to yourself sets up a different set of, of, of negatives in motion. So antidepressants, um, you know, people, if you can't, if you're not, not able to go down, then you're also not able to experience the highs or people put on weight or lose their libidos, lots of negative side effects to, to trying to get rid of the negative side of your life. So we can't, antidepressants are the largest prescription drug in the world today. And the reason is, and I, and, I, and I know that some people need them, so I'm not judging it, but we don't know how to be with our pain. We're too quick to, to, to look for solutions to make that go away. Um, and I'm gonna show you how to work with it rather than just try and get rid of it. So if it was really just a case of being rich enough, thin enough, married to Brad Pitt enough, then why are all the Hollywood stars in rehab 
you know, even the Dalai Lama, bless his soul, being, you know, all about peace and he's got war in his country. So we can't get rid of the negative side of our lives. Trying to get rid of the negative side of our lives is like trying to chop off the negative side of a magnet. If I had a magnet here today and I took a hacksaw and I sawed off the negative end of the magnet, I'm sure a lot of you will be aware that what I would be left with is two magnets. So the piece that I chopped off would have also a positive and a negative pole and the piece that I've chopped from would still have a positive and negative pole. So the good news and bad news is we can't chop off the negative sides of our lives, but we're going to learn how to work with them so that if you look at the amplitude of the waves at the top on the right hand side so that we reduce the amplitude. So now that we've established that, what is in the middle? In the middle is love and gratitude. That's between the polarized states of positive and negative perception. So why love and gratitude in the middle? And I like to use our children and pets as an example of unconditional love, which is the only kind of love there is, by the way. If it's not unconditional, it's not love. And so with our kids and our pets, we so get this side of what they bring to our lives, right? All the joy and the fun and the nachas and the great things that children bring to our lives. And yet we're so not blind to the challenges and the difficulty and the pain that they bring to our lives. You know, the sleepless nights with the babies and the terrible tantrums of the, the two and three year old age, um, private school fees, the teenage years, uh, you know, uh, all, all the pain that comes with it or the puppies that chew, chew your, your Jimmy Choo shoes. Um, but we don't get rid of them on account that they do bring us challenge and pain at times. We make a space that's big enough for both of that, which is why it's unconditional love. There's no condition under which we would not love them. So with our significant others, you, I'm sure you can recognize the dance of love. Sometimes it's I love you. Sometimes it's I can't stand you. Sometimes it's you make me feel so wonderful. Sometimes it's you irritate the living daylights out of me. Come to me, get away from me. I want to be with you forever. I don't even know what I'm doing in this marriage. Um, and this is the dance we're from, from feeling great. Um, and I think these t-shirts say it. Sometimes I love you, sometimes I hate you. And uh, that, I'm afraid, is as good as it gets. And that is love. It's not going to be peachy and wonderful all the time. They're definitely going, you're going to experience the law of polarity in all your relationships. I've got a wonderful old client when I shared this with her, she said to me, you know, I wish somebody would have told me this. And I said to her, well, actually they did because in the Christian tradition, right before you say your wedding vows, they say to you for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer in sickness and in health. <laughs> and that's, they're giving you a heads up what you're signing up for. And yet a lot of people are getting married for better and for, for wealthier. So that is why love and gratitude sit in the middle between the two polarities. So when in our perception, we imagine that something is more positive than negative, so positive greater than negative, we call that infatuation. So any of you out there ever fallen in love before? And I'm pretty sure every single one of you has. So what happens the day you fall in love? It's your lucky day, right? You just met the one person on the planet who has only positives and no negatives and the best part is that they think that you too have only positives and no negatives isn't it blissful and then what does it take 69 months sometimes longer slowly but surely those negatives start stacking up and they come down off the pedestal that you put them on hopefully into the center where you can love them but for many people they keep going down 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 into the pit to the negative side uh, where you break up, divorce, or fire them. We don't only get infatuated with uh, people in love relationships. We get infatuated with jobs. We get infatuated with business ideas. So anything that we get infatuated with, where we're seeing more positives than negatives, means we're not seeing the truth. And that's why we do due diligence when it comes to business ideas. And with jobs, it doesn't take 69 months for it to come off the pedestal. It usually takes two or three days at your new place of work to discover that there are also difficult people working here and it's not always all it's cracked up to be or what I thought. So our infatuations generally will come down off the pedestal. Now, on the other side at the bottom, 
when in our perception we imagine that something has more negatives than positives, that's also what we call a lopsided perception, it's not the truth, we call that resentment. So any example in your life or, uh, you know, and I look at so many examples with my clients where they've had something incredibly negative happen and we're not saying that the negative thing, whatever it is, uh, you know, uh, something tragic in their business or their health or whatever the case may be, we're not turning it into a positive. But in time, they're able to slowly but surely stack up the positives, notice all the wonderful things that have happened, the new opportunities, um, the, the love and support that they've had, the way their lives have changed as a result of something that they initially thought was um, so terrible. Until a point, the powerful place is when they can stack it up sufficiently to balance the pleasure and the pain, to balance the positive and negative in their perception to the degree that they can say, I actually love that that happened and I'm grateful and I wouldn't have it any other way. Some of you might remember the Alison Berta years ago, terrible story um, about uh, you know, how she was left for dead on the road and she's went on to become an international motivational speaker. She's written a book. I see they made a movie about her life and I saw an interview with her some years after that terrible incident and they said to her, if you could go back, all those years and not have that terrible thing happen to you, would you? And she said, no, I wouldn't, because to the degree that it was painful for her, she reaped the equal and opposite out of that. Nelson Mandela goes to prison for 27 years and he comes out and pretty soon after, going, uh, after coming out of prison, he went on the Oprah Winfrey show. And Oprah said to him, you know, 27 years in incarceration, but it's a terrible regime, what a terrible thing. And he said, I've got this on DVD, he said, no, actually, having the rare opportunity to be away from the distractions of the world gave me the chance to do the most important work of my life. And she said, well, what was that? And he said, to work on myself. And she said, well, yeah, but did you really need 27 years? And he said, actually, I did. And in jail with me, were men of far greater intellect and education than I. And I had the privilege of sitting at their feet and learning from them. So he came out of jail with his perspective smack bang in the middle. If he had had a perspective of resentment, then his attitude would have been, you know, now you, now you bastards are going to pay. And he didn't come out like that. He said, where do we go from here? So this really is about the mindset of greatness. I think of Viktor Frankl, psychiatrist in, incarcerated in a Nazi concentration camp, who, who noticed that it was people with this mindset who were able to prevail. If we look at Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, he's famous for saying you cannot control your emo if you cannot control your emotions, you cannot control your money. Now your emotions are controlled by your perception of positive and negative. If you perceive positive, you'll be hated, and if you perceive negative, you'll be the opposite. So for him, when you know when the dot com bubble happened. He knew that if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. He didn't buy into it. And so when the bubble burst, he didn't, uh, he didn't burn. He didn't get to, uh, lose money in that. So the powerful perception is uh, if we're able to balance positive and negative and look for what there is to be grateful for and how it's serving. Now, where we get stuck is where we insist on holding on to our resentment or our negative perspective and refusing to see it in any other light. And if any of you take notes, this is probably the one thing that you do want to remember, and that is what you resist persists. So you will stay in a holding pattern until you're able to shift because it's only at the point that you balance those perceptions. If you look at the yellow star, um, where you're able to move and make a quantum leap beyond that. So I'll give you an example. A friend of mine was a pilot and he owned a charter company. So his whole life was about flying. His friends were pilots. He owned airplanes. And he developed a lung condition and couldn't um, get his flight medical renewed. And so he couldn't fly. And he was mightily peeved and went from pillar to post, all kinds of doctors to try and sort out his lung condition and nobody could sort it out. So for three years he complained and finally I got tired of listening to his complaints and I said to him, what part of you doesn't want to fly? And he goes, oh, don't talk rubbish, Renata, you know, all this hooga booga nonsense. And I said, all right, well, tell me about the last time that you flew. 
And he sort of went, mm, well, long story short, he took a plane into Nelspruit, a light aircraft. It's a very mountainous area. This is what it looks like. And he hit a storm and he had to do an emergency landing in this area. When he finally got the plane down on the ground, just I'm getting rid of the frog in my throat, <clears throat> he was so traumatized that he crawled into the back of the airplane and lay in the fetal position for five hours until he was rescued. So when he told me this, I said to him, you're just too scared to fly. And he said to me, oh, nonsense. And then, you know, when you see somebody have a light bulb moment where they suddenly see the light and he went, oh my gosh, you're right. So that moment where he saw that for the negative of the lung condition, the positive was that he didn't have to get back on the proverbial horse and he didn't have to face up to his macho flying buddies, that he was too scared to fly. And the moment he saw that, he was released within 10 days, his lungs came right, he got his flight medical and he just decided he was never going to fly light aircraft alone again in mountainous areas. So if you look here, when you balance the negative perception with the positive perception, um, in th that is where, that is where we, we, we see the light and we make the quantum leap. So in the atom, when the positive and negative charges collide, light is produced. In our minds, when the positive and negative perception balance and come together, we see the light. The light is the truth. And the truth, quite literally, will set you free. So when you're balancing the positive and the negative, there is your moment. Now, <clears throat> once, you've, once you, you're able to, 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 to balance the positives to the point that you can go, I'm grateful for this. And we do this by asking these kinds of questions. When we're sitting in that negative resentment, when we're sitting in negative perception, how is this serving me? What are the benefits of this? What is there to be grateful for? And really dig deep to look for those. That is the moment when we can see that this thing that I thought was, because otherwise we stay stuck. And you know people like this. I've guys that come, as long as they're resentful about their ex-husband, they don't find, they don't move on and find new love. As long as you're resentful towards your ex-boss, you're not able to, and, and you pretty much start to repeat the same pattern wherever you go. If you leave, it doesn't leave you. It's your lesson. So, you, so the work is for us to do so that we can um, balance our perception and move to the next quantum. So what I'm saying here is you cannot heal what you have not loved and you will not move on until you can see it in the light where you can be grateful and love what happened. Now, just in case anybody's thinking that we can ever attain a state where it's hum, I'm so enlightened, I see the balance in everything all the time. I'm sorry to, to let you know, but that doesn't happen because once you progress past this quantum and you have that light bulb moment, you only get that for a second and then you're immediately, you make a quantum leap and you're on to your next quantum <clears throat> to deal with and look what's lurking there, your next negative, your next challenge, your next difficulty, your next pain, your next level of shit to deal with. So we are here to love and to grow. Where's my cursor? We are here to love and to grow and the universe supports us perfectly in that process by continuously providing us with our very next challenge the minute we've overcome the last one. So just to, to give you an idea, if we look at the amplitude of these waves, you can see that the negative over here is bigger than in the next quantum as we're growing. So through our awareness, we don't allow it to go that far off the track before we bring it back and bring it back and bring it back. Some of this is just a, is just a function of, of getting older. Something that was a train smash for you when you were 19 is just a small blip on your radar now. You know, when you had a, your first fight in your marriage 20 years ago, it was a huge deal. And now it's kind of just <clears throat> minor irritation. Um, when you start on your journey in work, you know, you start at the bottom and it's a huge challenge. And as soon as you're on top of that, you get promoted, the Peter Principle, to your next level of incompetence, new challenges. Perhaps now you have to lead people. And just as, as soon as you're on top of that, bam, you're promoted to your next level. And so we keep growing um, on our journey. Now, to explain just an analogy of this, if we took one of those old-fashioned wooden spinning tops, and we painted one half of it black and one half of it white and wound the string around it. If I spun that top, you, I'm sure you'd agree that it would appear motionless and gray. And then as I 
I'm just gonna get the video back here. Um, as I as it would slow down, it would start by being grey and motionless. As it slows down, it would go black, white, 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 topple over. So that's an analogy for how, as we are able to increase our the 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 rate at which we can bring our perspective into the center and stay closer to love and gratitude you can see that we experience light 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 and we start to live closer so the amplitude base frequency people have got big amplitudes they're really having huge dramas and getting hugely angry and having big fights and then High frequency people, you, you know some people who just have a poise. They just seem more centered. They seem more poised. They're living closer. They, 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 their frequency is higher. And obviously, we all have times where we can decapitulate to lower frequencies and, and, then, and, and move up and down. It's not, it's, it's not static. So, um, yeah, so that just really speaks to, to, to uh, is the poise in people and in your business if you're able to constantly course correct and bring things that have moved off into the negative side through your processes and procedures and uh, interventions and conversations that you have in your businesses, you minimize those negatives and you bring those closer to the center. Um, So the big point here is that everything serves and deserves equally. I'm just going to say that again because it's really important, central to everything, is everything serves and deserves equally. So a lovely parable of this concept is the parable of the farmer in ancient China who was considered a rich man because he had a horse to help him with plowing. And one day his horse ran away and the villagers came and exclaimed at his terribly bad luck. And the villager just said, maybe. And the next day, the uh, horse came back, leading an entire herd of wild mustangs. And the villagers came and exclaimed at, the, exclaimed at the farmer's good fortune. And he just said, maybe. And the next morning, the farmer's son got up at dawn to begin breaking in one of the horses. And he was thrown off the horse and he broke his leg. And the villagers came and exclaimed, what a terrible thing without the help of your own son. How will you get your class done this year? And um, then uh, the, the following day, the, the soldiers came into town, the emperor's soldiers. Um, so I'm just trying to get rid of the videos on, on, in front of my screen. Um, and the soldiers had come to conscript the young men into war and the farmer's son couldn't go because his leg was broken. And of course, it continues uh, in many, many more verses and parables after that, but just all illustrating the fact that we can't judge anything in isolation, that very often there are, um, you know, uh, hidden benefits that, that we're not aware of. And, you know, whether you see this in a religious light or not, um, it really is the basis of faith, and it really is how we're able to move beyond fear and anxiety is that even when the positive is not immediately evident, we trust because it's universal law or have faith that there will be some way in which we are served in some benefit. Now, a lot of my clients will say, well, I don't like this because it sounds like you're raining on my parade. I like being happy and elated and being up. And, um, you know, now you're saying that I shouldn't be up and I shouldn't be too positive. And I'm saying that's not it at all. But the elation and the ecstasy that we experience when, we, when we're infatuated with something is, is, is not where it's at. The, the much richer state is when you're, when you're in a state of love and gratitude. So if you think about when you first hold that newborn baby in your arms, you don't go running around the hospital clicking your heels together. It's a deep, rich state of awe, just you know, that moment of just the perfection of, of what you're witnessing and experiencing in that deep love. Or if you're sitting with your loved one watching a sunset somewhere beautiful, it's not an elated state. It is a rich, centered state of, of, of love and gratitude. And that state, is so much richer than what I call the woohoos or the boohoos. So anybody can, you can get yourself hyped up into a state of woohoo, but I want to you caution you against that, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, because what goes up must come down. So the woohoos always lead to the boohoos. Now, 
I'm trying to get as, cram as much as I can into this time. We don't only get lopsided perceptions about issues and events in our lives. We also get lopsided perceptions about ourselves. So this is the truth about ourselves. We all also contain within us the law of polarity. We have strengths and weaknesses. We are highly disciplined in some areas and very undisciplined in other areas of our lives that perhaps are lower on our value system. We can be incredibly reliable with certain things and unreliable with others. We can be unselfish and we can be selfish. Um, we can be very nice, sweet, wonderful people and we're all cap cranky, capable of being cranky and full of it. We can be supportive and challenging, brave and fearful, the list goes on, but we have both sides. And of course, there's reams of psychology written about our shadow side, which is all of those uh, so-called negatives that we're in denial about. And that's part of the work. So an example of something that somebody might disown is a trait called stingy. And, um, you know, somebody might say, well, I'm not stingy. I'm very generous with my money. But we may have the same trait in a different form. Um, so, so one person might be stingy with money. Somebody might be stingy with time, with knowledge, uh, with sex, with compliments. We can be stingy with, with various things. It's still the same trait. So we can own it. Um, in fact, we all have all the traits. We just have them in different forms and different areas of our lives. Now, when we imagine that in our perception that we have more positives than negatives or the self is greater than others, we call this being self-righteous. So I'm better than you, my idea is better than yours, my car is better than yours, whatever the case may be, where we puff ourselves up and we start to believe in our own PR, that's sort of self-righteous. On the other side of the spectrum, when we perceive that we have more negatives than positives or the self is less than others and we're beating ourselves up and feeling not good enough, we call that self righteous and obviously that's a made-up word. Now, many of us live, we have moments. We have moments of being self-righteous and moments where we're beating ourselves up, moments where we're confident, moments where we think we can't do it. But people live overridingly somewhere on the spectrum. And for the arrogant, cocky people who kind of put themselves up on the pedestal, we all subconsciously know the law of polarity. So we know that if somebody walks into the room looking like they think the sun shines out of all their orifices, we know that that can't be true. And in our minds, we all subconsciously start knocking them down off the pedestal and sort of going, oh, he's got horrible shoes and needs to lose five kilograms or whatever the case may be. So we start to knock them. And similarly, when somebody's beaten up and going, you know, I just don't have what it takes and I just can't and whatever, um, we, we kind of want to build them up, etc. So we either put ourselves up on the pedestal or down in the pit, but that is not the truth of who we are. The truth is that we deserve love and gratitude from ourselves and others and we are worthy of it. And those self-righteousness and self-wrongsciousness are just lopsided perceptions. So the self-righteous people are interested in having and receiving. Because I'm so amazing, people should just give to me and I just want. The self-righteous people are in, more interested in giving and doing. Because the more I give and do, I can stack up positives so that you will perceive me as being worthy of love. The self-righteous people are narcissistic. The self-righteous are altruistic, which means they, they're charitable. The narcissistic want something for nothing. The altruistic give something for nothing. The, the self-righteous sacrifice others for their lives and the others sacrifice their lives for others. Now, when we put ourselves up on the pedestal, the universe will always maintain full quantum. So if we get puffed up a little bit and we start to think that we're quite hot shot, we will attract distracting low priorities, which is an equilibrating factor just to bring us back down off our pedestal. All those shitty little things that you don't want to be doing that get in the way of what you want to be doing. If we get a little bit more cocky, we're going to get resistance or challenge to bring us down. If we really start to think that we're uh, quite something, we're going to get humbling circumstances and ultimately tragedy. And that is to bring us back down. Similarly, if we're down in the dumps being self righteous we will attract high focus priorities, support from others, pride building circumstances and comedy. So just the opposite. And that again is to build us back up. 
And our spouses and significant others and bosses and colleagues and children and, and uh, siblings are great at doing this for us, right? So the people around us. So if you come home and you've got this great idea and you're going to start this business and you're in a positive future, your wife will go, but hold on a second, remember the last time and you're in a positive future and she reminds you of a negative past. And so people always say, oh, my spouse rains on my parade, it pops my bubble. And I say, no, it's just an act of love. They're just equilibrating you. Similarly, when we're down in the dumps, the people close to us are the ones that come and give us a shoulder rub and say, you can do it. We believe in you. You've got what it takes. And they're there to, to support us and, and build us back up again. So when we get ourselves out of whack, when, we, when we're down or, or in any way, I've, that's my feeble attempt at drawing flames, a fire um, at the bottom there with the heat rising underneath our bums, which it's uncomfortable for us to be down there. And so when we are being challenged or we are um, in pain of experiencing negativity, we then start to ask the big questions. You know, what's going on here? How do I overcome this? Why is this happening? And we start to ask all these great questions and we start seeking answers and we start to galvanize in those high focus priorities. What do I need to do? And the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your questions. And so where do the answers come from when we start asking these questions? Your first port of call is your body is going to give you, start giving you signs and symptoms. Your body is going to start giving you answers, letting you know that you're out of whack, that you need whatever it is. Your intuition, your gut instinct, if we would just pay attention to that, because how often do we say, sure, I knew it. Um, I shouldn't have done that or I should have whatever. Um, the people around you, you know, the ones that care most will probably give you the most challenging messages and let you know. Um, that something's going on, that you're out of whack. And then obviously those little, those little serendipities, those coincidences, those things that happen. So we're being guided and the answers coming to us all the time if we would just pay attention. So let's talk briefly about time. So what happens to time if you're having a fantastic time somewhere? It flies, right? I wish I, wish I could see faces and hear voices, but time flies when you're having fun, they say. And what happens to time if you're having a terrible time somewhere? It slows down, it drags, right? So look how powerful we are. Just with our perception, we distort the fabric of space-time. So therefore, focus depends on our perception. Because if something fantastic happened to you, um, you know, you're infatuated, you're in la-la land, you're falling in love, it's very difficult to focus on, on, on what you want to be focused on. Similarly, if you're going through a really tough time and you're down in the dumps and, you, and you're experiencing pain or heartache, it's also very difficult to focus. So positive and negative perceptions remove our focus. And the only way to stay focused is to balance those and bring ourselves back into the center because that's where focus can happen. Inspiration can happen. Um, I'm gonna to touch lightly now on this concept of overworker, underworker, which is a very well documented and researched phenomenon. So you always have in your organizations and your teams, your superstars, the people that over deliver, um, that, that, you know, really, really do great work. And then you've got everybody along the spectrum. Um, I'm seeing people are talking. Can we, can we mute microphones? Thanks. Sorted. Um, and then you've got your underworkers, your deadwood, your, your low performers. And what it's been shown is that whatever interventions you do, if you remove the underworker, then somebody else for some reason starts to show up in that, in that position. So with the interventions that you do, your performance management, your, your reviews and feedback and all the things that you do to improve performance in your organization, you won't get rid of the disparity between overworker, underworker, and you would be wise to set the bar in the middle. If you set the bar at the top, at the overworker level, people become disparaged or discouraged. Um, so set the bar in the middle. The best analogy that, that I've had from a client about how, how this works is in terms of improving performance, is he said when in the old days in conscription in the army, um, in the first few months, everybody had to run, I think, 10 kilometers every day. 
there were some rude words that described it. Um, and he said, in the beginning, you had your, your fit guys who were first and you had everybody down to the very unfit people who were last. And he said, after three months of, of all running 10 kilometers a day, the fit guys were still first, the, the unfit guys were still last, but everybody ran it faster. So you, you move your, your, your level of performance in your team or your organization up by quantums, but still with the disparity between overworker and underworker, but you're narrowing that gap all the time. You're bringing everybody closer to the performance level. Another very well-researched phenomenon is bullying or being overpowered um, and the, uh, you, you know, obviously that happens on the playground with children, but it happens in organizations. I deal with people often in, in companies who are being overpowered or bullied in the workplace. And essentially to the degree that you are underpowered and you are not in your power and you are not um, finding your voice and standing up for yourself, the bully is your teacher. The bully is there to make you own your power because what happens when people are bullied, and I had a foster son who, who was bullied relentlessly and it was heartbreaking, so I have great compassion for this, but essentially he had to, like most children, be coached to stand in his power and look the people in the eye and say, no, don't do that to me. Because to the, when we finally go, I don't deserve to be treated like this. I've had enough. I'm not putting up with this. Then we step into our power. We claim our power. And then we bring ourselves back. We bring ourselves up into our power and therefore remove the bully's power. And that's where we get fair exchange, which is how all our interactions should be held. Um, there's, what is the adage, uh, love thy neighbor as thyself, which you can't do if you don't see others as equal to, if you see people as, as, as less or more. So there's the fire underneath the bum again, the heat rising to make people to learn the lesson and step into their power. So this is just uh, to, to understand that nothing is ever missing, it just changes form. Um, I'm trying to think of a current example perhaps where we have lost a lot of our freedom, but we have gained new freedoms um, in terms of, I suppose, you know, what time you get up in the morning, etc. So look for that. Um, you know, if, if wealth is missing in the form of money, perhaps it has now arrived in the form of a deeper connection with your children and your wife or your family. Um, so it's, it's about looking where is the thing that I think I now no longer have, how has it shown up, in what kind of form. How spooky action at a distance works is when you take something in your life that you have perceived to be negative and you're resentful towards it and you can sit and do the deep work of looking for how's this served me, how has it benefited me and this is not easy to do by any means, it takes a lot of deep work um, and can take hours, days or months but if you're able to do that work to the point where you can go actually, I'm so grateful that that thing that I thought was negative happened to me because I can see, you know, the, the powerful impact um, that it's had in my life and I wouldn't have it any other way. Then the thing, the negative changes. So I've had people who once they've been able to uh, come into gratitude for somebody uh, who's done something supposedly terrible to them, um, I had a client who had a bank manager foreclose on him years previously. And when he saw in the seven years uh, afterwards, uh, the new business that he'd started that was so much more successful than the previous one, and he was grateful for it, that bank manager showed up on his doorstep um, to have coffee and a conversation with him. So very, very powerful things can happen in our lives when we are willing to do the work of stacking up and balancing our perception and bringing ourselves to a state of love and gratitude for whatever has happened in, in our lives. I think they say the most powerful prayer is thank you. Just in terms to bring it back to the corporate sphere, they did a study in Merrill Lynch, an investment company years ago, to determine what is the cause of a company's shares rising or falling, because that's their business. And they went into organizations globally and looked at everything from the HR to the marketing to uh, the processes, etc. And after a couple of years, the result of the study was that they found that if people in the organizations that they went into 
loved their jobs, were inspired by the services of, um, that they offered, um, and there was a, a vibration of love and gratitude in the organization, those companies' shares would rise. And if people were miserable and ungrateful and hated where they were, um, that had an impact on the company's shares falling. Richard Branson, I've seen three interviews with him where he was asked, what do you look for in someone to lead one of your companies? He obviously can't run all his companies. And each time his answer has been the same. He says, I look for somebody who will care about every person in that organization down to the tea, you know, down to the tea lady. Famously, his tea lady became uh, head of Virgin um, Music or Records. So uh, he's essentially saying that people who can have love and gratitude for people are the people that are successful leaders. So looks like I'm at an hour, so I'm going to stop there. Um, I am going to take questions now. Menachem is emailing them to me, and I'll have a look and see which ones are coming up uh, the most. But if I don't answer all the questions, um, please, please feel free to email me after the session at Renata at icon.co.za, and I'll be happy to, to Thank you. answer. Thank you, Renata. So I'm furiously just trying to get them through to you. I have sent you through one or two in the meantime, and I'm sending you through more now as we speak. Thank you. Nathan. I don't know if you've received them yet. Yes, I have. Let me have a quick look. Okay. Um, what about parties? Okay. I only have a question from Susan. I don't know if there are any more. There are more coming. I'm just doing one at a time. because it's Okay, all right. Okay, okay, great. So how do we, Susan asks, how do we find a way to lower our frequencies and stay closer to the truth and love line during a major crisis like now? So, Nahi, how do I get out of this? Sorry. What are you trying to do, Renata? No, no, sorry. I was just trying to get back to my screen. So that's a great question, Susan. Thank you. Um, and essentially, it's the same as we would have to do in any situation. And that is to say, where are the blessings and where are the opportunities? Um, and look for them. And that's going to, the answer is going to be different for all of us. You know, I, 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 you know I'm, uh, every time I engage in social media or listen to the news, or particularly just in my own life, look for where are, you know, where are the learning opportunities? Where are the growth opportunities? Um, and how is this going to serve? You know, I've realized that I probably won't have to do international travel and contribute to the carbon footprint as much as I have been doing after this because so much can be done virtually. Um, so, you know, look for the benefits. Look for what there is to be grateful for in what's happening in your home and in your family and in connection time. Um, and that answer is going to be different for everybody. So, you know, this difficult time, the, the work is the same. And it's also about looking at what am I judging in people around me? And then if you spot it, you got it. So if you're judging something in somebody else, you know, have a look and say, where, where do I do that in my own form? Because that keeps you in the center uh, rather than being self-righteous. Because the minute you get into judgment, um, you are putting yourself up on a pedestal relative to somebody else and you set yourself up to take the knock. So I hope that answered that question, but it really is about where are the benefits? How is this serving? Thank you. There have been a couple more emails I've sent through. Thank you. Okay. I think it's a similar question. Okay, there's a lovely question from Neil about um, how we extend this to assist our, our children doing, during um, and through this lockdown. Um, they seem to be coping nicely with the question, are they really? Um, so, yeah, I think it's just the same. I think we can role model and support our children also by, by highlighting and pointing out, um, you know, the time, the extra time that you have with them, 
um, how they are preparing themselves for a future to 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 do stuff on on, on virtual uh, programs and learning how to connect with their friends uh, like that and uh, you know whatever else it's it's what, whatever the benefits are in your household and pointing out you know the benefits um, to the planet and in the world you know so just um, Things are difficult and they're going to overhear the negatives. Those are going to be easy for them to, to overhear and to see. And they're, you know, conscious and aware of their own battles um, by trying to, you know, do their schooling at home and having parents who, you know, spread thin trying to work and deal with them and their homeschooling. So, yeah, I think it's about, I think it's about role modeling and highlighting um, all the, the you know, you know the really the blessings and the and the benefits and the things they are to be grateful for. So just talk about them. You don't need to preach about them. You can just comment, and they'll pick it up. They'll pick up that you know that this is a rare and special opportunity um, on many levels. Thanks, Renata. You know, <coughs> the the uh, invitation said that we're supposed to be having a discussion, but that's obviously not going to happen for a number of reasons, <laughs> not the least of all I'm unqualified. But the, the one point is, having been a student of yours for many years, is the understanding of gratitude. So one of the, I, I mentioned this to you yesterday, is every time I speak to someone, um, how are you doing? How are things going on your side? How, are you coping okay? How's the family? And I get this almost wonderful stock standard answer. No, thankfully, we are so, we're so lucky. You know, everything's so good by us. And then, almost in the same breath, people then list a litany of complaints. And what I've learned from you is that when I play back to them, hopefully verbatim, what they started the conversation with, which was actually at that time, unbridled gratitude, it stops them in their tracks. And I'm now using that tool for myself. So whenever I do get a little bit irritated or frustrated, I just take a moment to concentrate on the, on the gratitude that I have, which I have boundless gratitude. And uh, the irritations of life are, 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 are infinitesimal compared to the, to the gratitude with which I have. And that's something that I know I learned from you about understanding that every, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And everything serves and disserves in equal portions. And, and that's, I think that if there's one thing that I've taken from this refresher course, which was def definitely necessary from my perspective, it, it's that, is that nothing serves in singularity and everything is an equal dualism of serve. Serve good and serve bad at the same time. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Stephen to, to wrap up for us now. But uh, Renati, if I could just say a, a very deeply personal thank you for everything. And uh, wish everybody very, very well. We'll see you guys next Thursday. Stephen, over to you. Yeah, Renat, thank you. On behalf of all of the, the participants and all of us at, at Octagon and Graviton, um, thank you for taking the time and, and very much providing this, this very different perspective on, on things. Uh, we're living in a social age where access to information is, is so, so readily available. We walk around with these devices. We're all sitting in front of our laptops constantly. And unfortunately, I've got an old saying I say to my, my, my clients and investors all the time that always remember that the media don't sell good news. It's always negative. And right now, I think there's that, that, that litany of negativity that, that, that surrounds us. And to be able to, to balance that with the reminder, uh, I particularly loved your, your law of polarity. Um, and, and, and reminding ourselves that uh, the world is cyclical. Um, this, please God, will not last. Um, but I think the lessons that we can learn and take from, from this time uh, and translate that into, into positive is really the most powerful, most powerful part of it. So thank you for, for that insight and, and, and very much opening up that gateway for, for all of us. Um, please God, you'll join us again. Uh, even as a, as a, as a, as a guest, um, but also as a, as a participant on our future webinars. Um, and everybody else, thank you very much for, for the time taken. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all next week. And uh, really, just have a great day and, and really just find that, that sunbeam that please God can cast away all the shadows. It's there. We just need to look for it. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your time.